Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt. How are you doing? Oh, you didn't say my last name. That's that's feeling weird, feeling weird. <laughs> Matt, hmm. before we introduce our other friend, it occurred to me how much I used your government name yeah. <laughs> on our podcast of Degeneracy, and I apologize for that. Mm-hmm. I apologize yeah, no worries, man. No worries. for that after 10 years, so, mm-hmm. you know, trying to keep it more low-key for Koosh. <laughs> yeah, after, uh, you know, 10 years, you finally want him to be anonymous. Yep. There's a lot of mats in the world. You can go back and script. You can scrub that, right, Matt? Uh, yeah, I've got to go, go through about uh, 10 years worth of uh, content and, and scrub it. Re- re-upload, re-edit, and scrub everything. Just don't scrub the uh, ice cream cake. Oh, man. I'm never going to. I should upload that individually as its own like thing so that we never lose it. You should just play that at the start of every episode. Our friend Rakush is here once again. What? But I guess this is more of a regular thing now just because Rakush previously... You've guessed it on the not really guessed it, but made an appearance mostly when I've been either missing, yeah, Isekai, or on vacation, Isekai. So mm-hmm. I think moving forward, you'll be joining us a bit more on the regular. But boys, mm-hmm. I come to you this week with Matt. Mm-hmm. Stop me if you've heard this before. My continuing battle, losing battle with Father Time. I know. Now, let me pick a world word picture for you, friends, where this past weekend, I was, you know, on my mobile device, going through my various apps, trying to find some deals. And I was on the Mick app and saw that a large orange pop milkshake was $3. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, I'll go for said milkshake for $3. And I didn't realize, because with McDonald's, shrinkflation is real. We all know that extra large coffee is probably a large at this point that we're used to, but that's neither here or there. I ordered this large milkshake, and why is the large soda container that they use still humongous, where as someone in their mid-30s, I should not be drinking that much milkshake because, spoiler alert, I did not have a good night because my tummy rumblies were really bad. Uh, Matt mm-hmm. and Rakush, how much milk can you drink in your mid-30s right now? I mean, I'm lactose intolerant, so I'm I'm in trouble if I drink that much. And I drink lactose and lactose-free milk, so, yeah. you know, my, uh, I guess my and Rakush's tummies have been untrained to handle, uh, the intensity of a McDonald's uh, milkshake. Very much so. I also like recently switched over from 3% to 0% milk. And uh, oh. it's getting used to that as well is kind of interesting. So I feel like if I continue that for another two to three months, I don't even know if I can do 3% again. Oh, no. In the interest of science, can I interest you boys in downloading the Mick app <laughs> and purchasing a large orange milkshake for $3? <laughs> Let's see if I have that deal at uh, my local McD's. I actually haven't been to McDonald's in two months. Wow. Someone is healthy. Rikush, we haven't heard <laughs> no. from you for a while. And actually, I was actually thinking about it. Rikush, did you share your Japan experiences here on the Mistake Zone when you came back? I actually don't think I did. So one of the reasons is I haven't ha- actually had access to the PC, to recording in like, you know, a decently sound isolated space and stuff like that. Um, only really just got access to it this week. And yeah, I actually have not had a chance to talk about the Japan trip. Real quick, just because I know that we have a hopefully less beefy boy episode this week. Rikush, can you regale a few of your experiences from your Japan trip earlier this week? Oh my year? god, yeah, dude. Um, I'll talk about like two of my favorite parts of the trip. Um, one was going and seeing Mount Fuji, I think. I... I actually don't know if I truly understood what I was going to go and see uh, on that day itself. It was just kind of part of the trip where, you know, I was like, I'm going to go see it because it's Fuji and like, you know, 
you're here. You got to see it. Mm-hmm. Once I got there and I started looking at just like the the visual, right? Like just staring at it and, um, you know, the it, clear skies and everything as well. It was extremely overwhelming, actually. You just kind of like seeing something like that, that just I'm staring at it. It's it's real for sure. It's real, but it just doesn't register as like, you know, this this is an actual thing that I'm seeing right now. And yeah, that was like a super overwhelming part of the trip. Um, it was really cool. I absolutely had to battle a dying battery by 3 p.m. on that day. So that was really fun. Uh, I was not back in Tokyo at that point either. So there was definitely a lot of tension there on, you know, getting back in time and like, you know, having access to my phone and stuff like that. Um, I could speak a lot more about that part of the trip itself, but just to kind of keep things a little bit short and keep the episode moving. um, The next part I would say was uh, the first or second day that we got to Japan, we were in Hokkaido in Sapporo specifically, and uh, I found a skewer spot, and I just kind of went there because I was like, man, I want skewers, I want some beer, I want a Sapporo and Sapporo, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So I go there, and I'm sitting, and I've got this big grit on my face because it's, I think that was like the first moment in the trip where I actually caught my breath, and I was like, holy bleep, I'm in Japan, right? Like, it was kind of cool. And this dude starts talking to me. He's just like sitting next to me, speaking in Japanese. I don't understand much of it. Picked up like a word or two here and there. And then next thing I know, like, you know, I'm using the Google Translate app and like we're having a conversation for like what feels like a long time. Like, I think it was probably like three hours that I was talking to him. Then like the people working at the restaurant joined in, like this other person that was sitting a little bit down joined in. It was, it was amazing. Like, you know, it was just uh, this entire experience of like going and sitting with locals and like, you know, having this pipe dream, at least it felt like a pipe dream at that point that like, you know, I was going to go and experience that and to actually get that experience of like just shooting the show with some locals. Sorry for the language, I guess. Yeah, that was, that was also really, really awesome. Um, And that was early in the trip as well. So I feel like it kind of set the bar quite high or at least like it set the tone for the rest of the trip and yeah i was really glad that i got to experience that awesome where boys Mm -hmm. have to put this on the table uh when are we creating the japan 2025 group chat Ooh, (laughs) japan 2026 bro i got three weddings to go to next year kakush a lot of weddings Mm -hmm. friends will have weddings anytime (laughs) when will uh, japan 2025 with your the boys happen not in 2026 Mm -hmm. We'll see. We'll Honestly, see. we can still call it 2025. Just do it in 2026. <laughs> if we if we do it in December, we can <laughs> transfer over in the new year to 2026. So, what of the weddings is likely in December guy, next year? Guy. So you're saying you don't want to see the Christmas lights with your homies in Japan, Raku? <laughs> you don't want to see the illumination. I mean, I do, but I don't think I could skip my brother's wedding for that. So, uh, yeah. Well, after this episode, we can try to plan how to get your brother to get married in Japan. So In Japan? Yeah. I'm actually open to that. Let's okay. chat about okay. it. Anyway, I there was something I wanted to talk about with Rakush on the episode as well that I mentioned a few weeks ago when I, and I guess Rakush also watched Look Back. Rakush, did you watch it in theaters? I did. Yes. Okay. Quick editing note here, just a heads up, we accidentally go into spoilers before we say we're going into spoilers. So check the timestamps on this episode if you want to skip this section. Actually, Rakush, real quick, what's a look back? You know, I wish I'd actually written something down to explain it, but this is me buying some time to think up the words. But look back is a uh, one-shot manga written by Tatsuki Fujimoto in between Chainsaw Man parts one and two, uh, one of three one-shots that he had written. And they made a... I mean, I want to call it a feature length movie, but it's really like an hour long movie. So yeah. it's kind of like this weird space between like a short movie and like an actual feature length movie uh, padded with some extra features in theaters. The story is about these two girls who are mangakas, like artists. Uh, they kind of like grew up respecting and idolizing each other, like became good, close friends, uh, you know, just kind of exploring a lot of like you know their relationship over the years from like uh 
being kids to being working adults to being like you know successful artists uh in different ways and stuff like that and without going into spoiler territory um it's got a lot of your standard fujimoto stuff as well um if you know you know i'm not going to say anything more than that um i guess sharon i'll toss it back to you what did you think of it so i've been thinking about look back a lot since uh we saw it a few weeks ago and oddly not really oddly enough it is something that I've actually thought about way more often than I thought I would after I left the theater where, uh, as you said, Rikush, it is, you know, pretty short runtime, uh, hour 10, I believe. And yet it, while it is pretty self-contained, I think, Matt, stop me if you've heard this before. Mm -hmm. I'm at this point of my life where... I feel like every time I do watch a coming of age story, uh, regardless of the medium, regardless of you know who the storyteller is, the perspective, I usually walk away with some sort of existential knot in my stomach. And I think <laughs> look back is no different where I do think it's a really beautiful movie. And I think I want to talk about two different parts, but the first part, not necessarily a part, but the first thought I have when I think back to this movie is the beginning is such a celebration of these adolescent girls celebrating their love for manga, celebrating their love for drawing, and just what passion looks like and how, you know, you dedicate yourself to the passion, you, that passion in particular, and that, the different forms that it takes. And as we see the journey between these two girls, you know, going from uh, writing or drawing manga for their school newspaper to getting published in a weekly to getting their own serialized manga, all within this relatively short run span of, you know, when they're working, just because the I guess the central conflict comes when uh, one of the girls, uh, Kiyomoto, wants to pursue university while uh, Fujino wants to pursue her serialization. And I don't know about you, Rikush, but I think when they started fast tracking that manga, I guess, steps or flow of going from amateur to pro it started taking this weird, I don't know really how to describe it, but this almost whimsical fantasy element of this doesn't necessarily happen, but this kind of goes to what I'm assuming uh, Fujimoto is trying to portray in the story of what a mangaka like, goes through. But in terms of their road to becoming professional manga artist. Um, was that something you had to set in your disbelief for, or was it just something you took as normal? I think it's an interesting point that you're making as a general observation of mangaka as an artist, taking a long time to get mm -hmm. to a point of success. I do believe, and Matt, maybe you can correct me on this one, mm -hmm. but if I understand correctly, there's a little bit of an autobiographical element to the pace at which they become artists because i believe fujimoto had something similar happen with him in his career is that he started very young and he was getting uh, a lot of accolades and stuff like that so i don't know if like you know the friend part is uh something that inspired by true events or not uh, i'm sure there's more like fiction to that than anything else but yeah i, I guess that's an interesting point right it's like you so many of like you know these series that we read there's something that precedes it like even with dragon ball right like akira toriyama had something before that um one piece there was like a one shot that is very different than what it ended up being as well so like there's so many of these popular artists that yeah absolutely have to pay the dues before like you know getting to that point where they're actually like super successful but once we, we get past that, um, and I guess the climax happens, the story takes this 
I don't want to say weird, but this, for me personally, unexpected turn where it becomes less about, you know, following your passions, you know, working hard to be dedicated enough to achieve your dreams to how you cope with loss. And I think that the later portion of the movie is what really stuck to me where, you know, in the beginning of the movie, I was thinking, oh, it it must be nice to be really dedicated to something. But I think by the end of it, I'm kind of just fighting back tears to see how uh, Fujino is trying to come to terms with the fact that, you know, Kiyomoto isn't here anymore just because of uh, unforeseen tragedy. And also the mental block of I'm the reason, you know, six steps removed that she is no longer here. And that brings us to, I'm not sure what you would call it, but the portion that's essentially the quote unquote alternate dimension where uh, Fujino never got Kiyomoto to leave her room. And then we see how it turns out and eventually them coming together once again in this perfect world where in a way that's Fujimoto getting or Fujino getting everything that she wants sounds the loss. But I think at that moment I was maybe I was just watching from a casual perspective and I thought, oh, this is uh kind of a unique way to show what could have happened if Fujino never um gave that initial four piece manga to Kyo. But at the same time, I sort of forgot while watching that Kyo never did the same four panels that uh, Fujino made. And it kind of dawned on me that, uh, oh, this is just another way Fujino is trying to cope of her sitting in Kyo's old house. So I think that was also just something that for some reason, I've been thinking about a lot just how to handle loss, how to handle um, processing of that. But when it comes to that portion of the movie, Rakush, towards the end, how did you feel about that alternate perspective of Kyo never leaving her room? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it was a little bit weird, I guess, a little bit like, you know, just um, how to not out of place but like it was just definitely something a little bit bizarre with it right like there was this weird now parallel world that gets introduced there is this physical representation of a four panel comic like flying back out the door um but it was interesting where like to me so much of it is just this idea of growing up like you kind of described it a little bit as well this idea of being so passionate about something at such a young age and over the years just kind of realizing like you're just working and you know you're making a paycheck and like it's just a job and it's kind of like you know so much of what is represented in the series as well and you find different motivations right like i think when she stops drawing uh, i guess we're going to spoilers with this one so i guess we'll have the spoiler uh notes later but when she stops drawing because of the death she didn't have any motivation right like there was nothing that was really driving her at least in that moment to continue working through it and it's just like you said like finding different ways to get back to normalcy to cope with loss to cope with a significant change in her lives as well right so i think it was a great representation of that um personally i thought it was also I mean, a very delicate subject handled very nicely. Uh, There's a lot of people crying in my theaters. Um, I definitely understand why as well. Uh, But yeah, it it was a very sort of touching finale to it. I think suspending a little bit of disbelief with it also helps a lot as well, where you just kind of make of it what you will. Yeah, I think that was me towards the end as well, where, again, at first I thought, oh... I'm not really feeling this alternate dimension stuff. Uh, but at the same time, I personally read it as, oh, this is just another way that Fujino is coping with the whole situation. But um, since this was, you know, licensed by G Kids, and I'm not sure how many G Kids uh, licensed movies you guys have seen in theaters, but 
The few I have seen, they typically show a director or cast member interview at the end, uh, which adds on about, you know, 15 to 20 more minutes of just content to watch. And at the end of Look Back, we do have a kind of extended interview with the director, uh, Kiyotaka Oshiyama. And Rikush, how many people left during Man. that in your theater for this interview i absolutely wanted to kind of make a point about that it was super annoying seeing like i would say a third of the theater cleared out at his mm-hmm. part of the bts interviews and then another third cleared out with the voice actors right. i kind of wish people would have stuck around because i thought it was a pretty interesting interview yeah i think for my theater it wasn't super packed maybe I would want to say under 20, around 15 maybe, and only two people ended up leaving. The rest stayed for the whole interview. And there was one portion in the interview that I kind of wanted to get uh, both your thoughts on. And it was something that the director, Oshiyama, said that when he was approached to do a look back, he was a bit hesitant Mm -hmm. to do it just because this is such a slice of life, such a low action still story that's being told that as a director what do you do to you know fully captivate that audience and i do love how he highlighted two of the most you know noteworthy scenes in the hallway scene with kyo chasing after uh fujino and then with fujino walking home and essentially dancing in the rain where even during my initial watch before the interview those um scenes in particular stood out so much just how fast paced they were how you know the contrasted to every thing we saw either before or after and once that interview came around and he made the point of when you have such a still life story you need to make something that's really impactful for it and which makes those scenes in in turn stand out and i think that just has never occurred to me despite watching you know slice of life anime for over a decade now that when you they do emphasize any action in such a genre it is something that more or less sticks with me in comparison to any dialogue just because it is such a nice contrast but i guess rakush what did you think of those two scenes and i guess his thought process behind it Yeah, I mean, one of the questions I had going into the movie as well was like, how are you going to make an entire feature out of this? Because it took me maybe like 10 minutes to read the one shot. There wasn't much to like really like, you know, sit back and like a like stare at a panel or anything like that, at least for me personally. So I was very curious about this as well. I think they I think the director did a great job with it, just about being selective with the um, the motion, I guess, right? Like the action, whatever term you want to use for it. And when there was finally a lot of action, it really stuck. Um, it stood out quite a bit and it added a lot of uh, impact. It was like, you know, the emphasis was fantastic on those scenes and it adds to the emotion as well, right? Like so many times like you're just in throughout the movie like you know you're in still settings i mean beautifully drawn still settings but they're still sort of like a little bit still motionless lifeless whatever you want to call that and it's yeah like when the motion comes into play like you really kind of feel what the director wants you to feel so the execution on that was fantastic and i I guess my final point for just look back overall again this is such a love letter to manga where I think a lot of the sensibilities from, you know, uh, keep your hands off Yuzukin from, I believe it was 2020 or 2021. uh, Just some of the same feelings I had watching that series came back while watching Look Back. And again, it's just the celebration of manga, um, celebrating the craft, the passion towards it, but also really giving you a look you know, whether it be whimsy, whether it be exaggerated uh, at this craft and just showing appreciation to the people behind it where, you know, the moment I got back after I, 
you know, dried my or changed my shirt because my tears were damp. I mean, my sleeves were damp from all the tears. I <laughs> uh, just started watching a bunch of Izukin again, just because I don't know. It's again watching people passionate about their craft and then seeing what forms something that's otherwise pretty dry uh, take on to be more um, just engaging, to be more interactive. Uh, so that, that's kind of what I've been taking away from Look Back and in and, and extension Izukin. But uh, that's enough of my nonsense rambling. Uh, Rikush, final thoughts on Look Back. I thought considering the limited source material, they did a great job with it. I want to see a feature film for Goodbye Airy. That's the one I, I really, really want to see. So I'm hoping this one is successful. It had all the emotional moments it needed to. I think thematically it was fairly accurate to what Fujimoto drew. So, yeah. And I apologize to Matt for uh, taking the backseat there. <laughs> Matt, I have one question for you based on Look Back, though. What's up? Where uh, the manga that, you know, Fujino and Kyo make... Uh, mm -hmm. to make it big is Shark Kick, which is obviously a tribute to Chainsaw Man. So good. Matt, <laughs> what's your favorite not manga in a manga? Oh, I can't really think of many. Like, I feel like just because you guys were talking about basically a mangaka based, um, I guess, one shot movie. Yeah. All I'm thinking about right now is like Bakuman and like the series that were in there. What were the series that were in there? I mean, they had Crow, which was like the one like the main rival was doing. They had, oh, what was it? I, it was something that like the Detective Club, a PCP Club or something like that. Which I think I might just be saying the name of a drug, but, but it was like that. It was like that manga about kids doing like actual pranks that kids could do. Hmm. And how that could never be an anime because they thought it was going to influence kids to pull pranks at school. Amazing. Matt, what's your favorite schoolyard prank? Oh, I don't know. Jer I mean, I can't think of a prank right now other than a whoopee cushion. <laughs> classic. It's a classic. Very classic. It's a classic. It's a classic and it always sucks to get got by it. Oh, man. Well, boys, since we're still here in the anime corner... I uh, didn't do a check-in last week, but episodes three and four of Da Don Don, Down Da Dan, I don't know how to pronounce it still. I should probably look it up, but I won't. Uh, this concludes the Turbo Granny arc. And as a solely anime watcher, uh, for now maybe, uh, I kind of enjoyed the, I guess the first four episodes of this series. Definitely something that has left a good impression on me, mostly through... Uh, just the animation and the overall style. Uh, I think, I know we're going to try to, you know, lightly tread on spoilers just because, uh, Rikushi, you said you were caught up with the manga, Matt, you read a portion of the manga as well. But I think real quick for me, what I did appreciate for the, f like, episodes three and four in particular was that for the most part, it still keeps that, balance between you know the romantic aspect or potential romance between uh, Momo and Ken but at the same time still giving you a good portion of action that you would expect from a shonen anime that Matt I know you said this more so may lean towards the romance angle but I think the anime so far has been pretty good with its shown in sensibilities even for episode three that was more so kind of exploring the dynamics between not only momo and ken but uh momo and her grandmother as well we still did get that interaction between turbo granny and um momo's grandmother as well which i thought was pretty fun so i guess my first question to you guys why is uh granny ayasi so young looking it's an anime, German. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, no, that's manga spoiler, so I won't say anything. Okay. Is there a reason, Rakush, that gets looked into or brought up? Or is it, as Matt said, just an for anime reasons? Or a bit I, of both? <laughs> I feel like it's, like, vaguely brought up. It's not fully confirmed just yet. Um, so it's probably going to be a uh, plot point in the near future. Fair. 
Uh, but for, I guess, the end of the Turbo Granny arc, what also kind of surprised me, uh, and I'm not sure if you guys agreed, was how Momo-centric kind of three and four really were in terms of actually showing off her powers and not even just how cunning she was as Ursh is as well, where we do see Ken and him transforming uh, here and there um, and some flashy just action coming from him. But I think for the most part, the planning, execution, uh, and even just trying to adapt on the fly to their surroundings, a lot of it did come from Momo. And I I guess I just wanted to ask you guys, is that... how? How's the focus in terms of the two central characters? Is this something where each of them really get their own arcs to shine? Or I think moving forward, does one kind of get more of a spotlight than the other? Matt, you want to take this? Uh, I actually don't know if I can, because I dropped this manga pretty, (laughs) not like early in its run. I stuck with it for maybe like a year before I fell off, and I... Cannot remember anything like outside of the episodes that I've watched because I, you know, I think it's Fair. been like a few years since it came out, which is when I was reading it. Yeah, I think it's been it must have been like three years now since the manga. Debut. Yeah, that seems about right. Yeah. Yeah. I think Momo gets a lot of shine. I do think the focus is fairly well balanced between the two of them. I think one of the good things about this series is actually how balanced like the entire cruise dynamic is and stuff like that so it's balanced but i do feel like momo gets so far at least a lot more attention or a lot more of the combat than um okarun does fair and i guess riku since you are caught up uh how how did you think about the first four episodes of the anime itself and Since you're a avid manga reader, how is the transition (laughs) from pages to, I guess, animation? Avid manga reader is funny. I read like two mangas right now. Uh, Um, You're caught up, so that's pretty avid to me. (laughs) Um, Honestly, I've been really, really impressed with uh, Science Hour, I believe, as a studio. Like, they've done a great job actually capturing the entire essence of the manga itself. Uh, Some of the early trailers, I had some doubts about things but the way they have it animated still shots do not look as good for this series when you see it in motion it's absolutely fantastic and i think they've done a great job so far of capturing a lot of just the energy that comes off of the panels themselves in a way that's actually very true to what the series is i mean like one of the last series i spoke about in depth on the show was chainsaw man and my issues with that series and how like you know potentially some of the essence of the manga itself was not captured well i don't i think it's the complete opposite with this one i think like science art has done like a very good job staying loyal to the source material so if you don't read the manga and you keep watching the series as long as this quality stays up which it is a big if let's see what happens other series have you know been fantastic season ones and then like for some reason they just turn into Duds season two onwards, looking at One Punch Man. Yeah. Um, Yo, Blue Lock, man. Blue Lock. <laughs> Blue Lock, yeah. Like, you know, there's a lot of those. But if they maintain this quality, yeah, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, I'm enjoying my time with it. I'm curious who the other characters are in the OP right now. And I have to admit, ever since uh, episode three, my TikTok went from Momo <laughs> cosplayers to uh, Granny Ayasi cosplayers. So oh, take God. that for what you will. Yeah, tracks. Yeah, it's, uh, you got a very curated TikTok there, Jaren. Yeah, and I, I tell you more about my algorithm, but we can save that for another time. Matt, I'll side note, side note, before we move on for <laughs> oh, this sure. show. You know what's really catching me off guard is that the voice actors in Japanese for Turbo Granny and the aliens are Luffy and Zoro from the Japanese One Piece dub. Do they sound similar enough or are these? It's identical. It's identical. Like they've obviously added filters to Turbo Granny, Mm -hmm. uh, but Zoro was just Zoro. Like that was, you know how like sometimes a voice is just that voice like you know that character is that voice Uh it's very difficult for me to like unhear and unsee like luffy and zoro from these characters 
<laughs> that's the only thing about this series that I'm like, damn. <laughs> How do you feel about Luffy wanting people's weenie? That's honestly that was the part where I'm like, man, <laughs> don't know if I want to keep hearing that, but okay. Rikush over under <laughs> is the One Piece a weenie? Is is the <laughs> you mean the treasure the One Piece? Yep. You know what? Knowing Oda, it could be a weenie. I can't believe they spoiled One Piece through uh, <laughs> Don Don. Yeah. Actually, I, I asked Matt this, so I should probably ask you this, Rikush, since you're you love One Piece, Matt uh, Rikush. Over under, is the One Piece going to be some sort of representation of friendship? So there have been some interviews in the past where Oda has said it's going to be something material. I, I I don't know. Maybe he could have changed his mind. I don't think it's one of those friendships we made along the way things. I think it should be because you know <laughs> how much I love friendship. But Matt, uh huh. speaking about friendship, mm-hmm. uh, we were both playing games that had social link equivalents. Yes. But um, I think for me, at least, that's taken the back burner to a game with also a social link equivalent. And Matt, I have to ask uh-huh. you, uh-huh. how's the Mistake Zone Zero right now? Uh, Jaren, it is going into a wild place, I think. Mm-hmm. Because we are on the cusp of a probably like a decently big content drop of uh, Xenazone Zero 1.3. 1.3, right? Yes. So our adventures with the Sons of Caledon are over for now. Mm -hmm. And there was... Matt, a lot of mobile and gacha games had their big info dump streams last week. Uh Um, I know we're specifically talking about ZZZ, but also, you know, Arknights has their... Big um, update this week. Nikkei has their second anniversary this week. So a lot of mobile info dumps. But in terms Mm -hmm. of ZZZ Mm -hmm. uh, 1.3, what are you looking forward to what's been announced, Matt? So, Jaren, I think one of the big things that's been announced for uh, Sentence 0 1.3 is the two new characters of uh, Yanagi and Lighter. Jaren, I think I'm going to be going in on Yanagi because I believe in the anomaly meta yes. that seems to be being built in Zenless Zone Zero. And Jaren, are you going to go in on Yanagi or no? So, Matt, you know me. I'm a Miyabi boy right now. Mm-hmm. And I, it's hard for me to say I should skip uh, and wait until uh, Miyabi, because one, I'm sorry, Matt, uh, Yanagi's design doesn't really do anything for me. And Lighter, mm-hmm. as much as I think Lighter is a bro, I think, I don't think anything's really been shared about his play style, correct? Um, they showed off that he is a fire stun. He is inside of this, um, I guess, like showcase that they did a couple days ago. They showed off that his core passive is going to be buffing fire and ice based characters. So there's a lot of like, you know, kind of thought about Miyabi dropping in 1.4. But I feel like they say that every every patch where, you know, a lot of the kind of lineups for Xenostone Zero's character drops tend to be that, hey, this character is going to work with the upcoming yeah. character just to, you know, get break into your wallet just a little bit. You know, right after you spent, they're going to make you spend more. And a lot of people are thinking that Lighter is either going to be followed up by an Ellen rerun or a Miyabi drop. Yeah, I, it, it's hard, Matt, just because as much as I want to skip them, mm-hmm. again, this is a team building game at its core. Mm-hmm. And pretty much all the teams right now do revolve on the character of the month or character of the three week period where even though I don't want to roll them, something's telling me I kind of have to just because thankfully for me, Jane, she was being supported with both Caesar and Bernice where Mm -hmm. I think I could manage, but at the same time I need a second team at for the Mm -hmm, defense mm -hmm. mission. So I don't know that that was a long winded way of saying I probably won't, but I probably will. (laughs) At the uh-huh. end of the day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, also within this kind of like showcase, other than showing off the two characters, you know, they showed off a bunch of 
you know, miscellaneous stuff, a bunch of quality of life changes within the game, a uh, couple new, like, you know, Bang Boo getting added. But I think probably the big, big thing that uh, was shown off is the, the figures in your game. room. The figures in your room. Okay. I have a question for, like, you, Jaren. I guess, like, Rakush as well, which is that this is going to be, as far as I can tell so far, just decorations being added to the bedroom of the character that you play as. And is this, like, is decoration in a place that you don't care about or you don't go to really, or at least I don't go to really, something that you guys care about in games? Because I feel like they could have added something a lot more interesting than adding figurines that you put, you know, in a room that you very rarely have a reason to go to. Uh, Rakush, do you want to share your thoughts before I share mine? I mean, I'm indifferent, but I do find it amusing that that mm-hmm. you're a homebody except in video games where you don't go home. But see, the thing is that, like, I wouldn't mind hanging out inside the home if there was a reason in game to hang out in the home, right? Like, this is, for example, like, good vibes. It's making them decorate the a room that you don't visit versus a room that you do visit a lot. Because, uh, like, there's a computer room in essence inside of uh, this game that you visit very often and i would have rather you'd able to decorate that room versus you know not that room but yo bro if you decorate the other room you have more reason to go in there i feel like um i guess i've never really discussed this with you before but when i play games i optimize as much as I can in them. And if there's no reason, if there's no <laughs> gameplay reason to go somewhere, I'm not going to go there. I mean, I just picture basically what you're saying is you're min maxing Animal Crossing. Yeah, it's min max Animal Crossing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, me personally, Matt, uh huh. I love playing around with the memory board <laughs> in your character's room. <laughs> My memory board, I. Have Jordan, designed it. Three things you can put on the memory board. Matt, my memory board is full of memories that my bell has lived. And uh, you're talking to the guy who cut fully customized his Fallout 3 home for. Oh, man. <laughs> because even though I never went to that Fallout 3 home, I knew it was decorated. Oh, man. Couldn't be me. Couldn't be me. Uh, see, Jaren goes for vibes. <laughs> uh, well. What from 1.3 are you also looking forward to? I mean, the new, I guess, like, big mode that they're adding is the Battle Tower, which is essentially from what I've understood from the live stream and what I've seen of people kind of just, like, leaking info from the beta is that it is at least 100 floors and it follows the system of you, you know, you select your characters, you go in, and then you, like, do a fight. And it's an endurance-based sort of thing. So when you leave the fight, you don't heal or anything. But, you know, you're going to be getting bonuses, whether it's, you know, power-ups or other characters that you can add to your roster to, you know, pick for future fights. And then, you know, you kind of keep doing this endurance fight for X amount of floors, and then you're you're out of the endurance and you're able to, like, leave and claim your prizes. And I don't know. I think that's interesting. I think... Genshin does something similar where Mm -hmm. I'm also just kind of expecting at some point that a lot of the features that might lend themselves in Genshin will find their way in Zen Zone Zero in some capacity Mm -hmm. where I'm not sure how much of the crossover between, you know, Genshin and HSR was, but there were some aspects in that one year that I played of Genshin that I wouldn't be surprised if uh, they made it in some way where, you know, speaking about Animal Crossing, Genshin, you know, year one had essentially, let's customize your own floating island. Uh, And I'm not Mm -hmm. sure how that would work in the perspective of ZZZ, but maybe we'll they'll take room customization a bit further and these figures are the first step where yeah I, I do agree though matt that i would like to customize the hdd room or whatever it's called mm-hmm. um, and i kind of wish the memory board was in that room in comparison to the bedroom 
But I don't know. It's still fun when you invite a friend over to watch a movie and you spawn in that room or you have to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those are few and far between, uh, however. But yeah, Matt, anything else from this upcoming patch uh, that you can't wait to get your hands on? I'm actually looking forward to um, the lighter mini game that they're adding for this patch, which is basically a beat em up. And someone. I'm excited. mm -hmm, Someone had basically pointed out that they. I think it was. They pulled the lighter's moveset exactly from it might have been streets of rage but it might have been something else i know they they lifted lighter's uh beat em up moveset directly from a different <laughs> beat em up game that's pretty good that's a good goof mm-hmm. matt that's mm-hmm. a good goof mm-hmm. uh but yeah zone zone zero matt do you know when 1.3 drops uh 1.3 is going to be dropping on november 6th I believe. oh next week yes. soon that soon mm-hmm. soon soon Matt, speaking about Animal Crossing, Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess now that we're talking about mobile and gotcha games, uh, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, uh, Nintendo announced, I think for a minute now, that it would be, you know, end of servicing soon, but Mm -hmm. they would create or at least update it into a paid version. And Matt, Mm -hmm. can you tell me about the, I guess, would you say upgraded Animal Crossing Pocket Camp that will, I believe, be launching on December 3rd. Yeah, so the complete version, which is going to be called Animal Crossing Pocket Camp Complete, is going to be launching on December 3rd after, you know, standard Animal Crossing Pocket Camp does an end of service on November 28th, Hmm. which is kind of surprising. I'm surprised that they would have... What is that? Like, maybe like a week's worth of time where you're, you're like gone from the game. Yeah. But I guess, like, unsurprisingly, you know, with this end of service, they're going to be turning the game into its own kind of feature complete version that is no longer going to be connected to any servers or anything. Yeah. Um, but what they're going to let you do is transfer basically your save file, like, containing your character itself, like their bells, their friendships with animals, all their items and, like, outfits. And you're going to be able to transfer it over to. Animal Crossing Pocket Camp Complete to be able to basically be playing a full mobile version of Animal Crossing. They are going to be discontinuing some stuff, kind of like their equivalent of the, I guess, like premium monthly pass that lets you get, like, get additional stuff. It's going to disable online play for letting you connect with you know your friends, and they're going to be discontinuing the Leaf Tickets currency, which... I don't I can't remember if this is actually a paid currency or not, but it is their equivalent of like, you know, the the currency that you spend to make things go faster in this kind of real time game. Yeah. But when it transfers over to Animal Crossing Pocket Camp Complete, they are going to be kind of replacing it. Some stuff like the leaf tickets are gonna be replaced with tokens, which are basically gonna be doing the exact same thing. Um some of the stuff from the Pocket Camp are going to be made fully available without having to what do you call it? You know, subscribe to something. And they're going to be adding features like letting you walk around with, you know, your 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 friends, uh, saving layouts and, you know, a lot of quality of life style changes. Mm-hmm. And additionally, you know, they're going to be, since they're removing online play, really the way that you're going to be interacting with other players now is by creating QR codes that basically creates like a trading card that contains you and one of the villagers or campers i guess in this case and you know you generate the picture it generates a qr code and then people can scan it and there will be an area in game where you can see anybody who was on your friends list assuming they signed in after the latest update and anybody whose qr code you scan and they have said that this game is going to be working on a i was very surprised to see that's going to be working on a four-year cycle uh with events that like previously happened and there's going to be like new events and stuff too which is i'm i'm honestly surprised that at the four year cycle because that seems like such a long time yeah so they're supporting this service then no it's not that they're supporting it like you know how in standard animal crossing games basically every year there is like you know a certain event at christmas a certain event at like easter and stuff like that since um from my understanding at least since Pocket Camp was a live service game. Basically, every year they would 
you know, have some repeating events, but they would also change it, change them up ever so slightly so that, you know, you had fresh content throughout the year. So it wasn't always a, you know, repeated game every year. Mm -hmm. So from my understanding, the four year cycle is that every four years is going to be is like it's going to take four years to repeat everything that's happened in game. So you're going to have like, you know, spring event one in like spring of next year and then spring event two in the spring after in like 2026 do you know what i mean got it man that that's actually just really weird and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. honestly you going through i guess just it's i guess quality of life features that's a lot more than i would expect this to get and mm-hmm. again this is pretty unprecedented when it comes to mobile freemium games just because matt let's face it when something ends of service is it's donezo. You can kiss uh-huh. your content. You can kiss mm. your licenses. You can kiss your characters goodbye. Mostly because, you know, at that point, the publisher, if they're still around, is trying to funnel you to their next, you know, gotcha game, to their next yeah. mobile game. Yeah. Where I'm actually really surprised that Nintendo is doing this. And it would kind of give me hope that, you know, eventually when fire emblem heroes stops printing money maybe they'll get the equivalent to this as well Mm -hmm. or i'm not sure what they're doing with mario kart tour but something similar uh pour one out to dragila loss just because i guess they missed the boat but Mm -hmm. yeah i correct me if i'm wrong matt but i believe the price point is 20 dollars to buy in but it will be have a 50% 50% discount for the first month. So I think 10 USD uh, as the buy-in price. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But while I think that $10 might be fair, and you know that is, of course, a marketing trick just to kind of get you in seeing that 50% off, mm-hmm. uh, I think it does hurt for the people who have spent a notable amount of money um, on this game, on you know those leaves or tickets or whatnot, where, you know... The hope would be if you spent a certain threshold, you'd get either a higher discount or even just get the um, complete version for free. But I guess they're not running a charity here, Matt. But Mm -hmm. Mm got to ask, uh, are you buying into it, Matt? I think I might because I played it a bit when, um, you know, as a group, we were all playing Animal Crossing back in pandemic, like hard Mm -hmm. pandemic times. And... You know, while I'm not, I don't think I really like got that much stuff back then. Jaren, they got me with the with the fifty percent off uh, price. Yeah. I think because a weird stipulation in what they said is that it is nine it is uh nine ninety nine USD in the US, mm. and I'm wondering if that's like oh then Canada is gonna get full price. I guess we'll see when this happens on December. 20 or Mm third correct are either of you planning on like checking out um while it's still like in while it's still live before it fully shuts down were you a pocket camper every i probably installed it once years ago when i was trying to spend some money from the google survey money Mm. but i don't have much of a recollection of it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i'm good I'm probably not going to log in. I'll probably end up getting it just from a weird sicko <laughs> preservation uh, preservation uh, perspective. Uh, mm-hmm. But I don't know if I'll ever log in. But I have to admit, Matt, mm-hmm. um, this was just, you know, another mobile game announced that it would be delisted uh, on October 31st. And it would be fully, the servers would be taken down on January 24th, 2025. Uh, After 12 years, The Simpsons tapped out uh, will be, as I said, delisted end of October and fully shutting down by the end of January 2025. And Mm -hmm. this has been a game going on for 12 years. And surprise, I was actually really into The Simpsons tapped out 12 years ago. Uh, Back when it was just, you know, this free-to-play game with The Simpsons, um, kind of candy wrapper on it. It was a town builder with a lot of the similar uh, free-to-play trappings at the time. And even that continued today where, you know, you're 
trying to get in-game currency, collecting currency from characters, and then buying blueprints to buy new buildings and in turn create your own Springfield. And within the 12 years, they've noted that the game has saw over 300 updates, 831 characters for you to collect, and over 1,400 quest lines or, you know, just quest missions where the only reason I wanted to bring this up was, I'm not sure if you guys knew this, but in 2012, uh, one of the reasons I was really into The Simpsons Tapped Out was because you, you want to know how Wild West mobile freemium games were uh, over a decade ago? What happened? There was, you could glitch it and duplicate premium currency. And Ooh. I remember it being like an 80% success rate where I freak, maybe I'll look it up and uh, say it next week. But I remember if you, it, it had to do with uh, killing the app while something was processing and if you did it successfully, you would have doubled how many of the currencies that you put into it. And I don't know, just thinking back that <laughs> there was literally a loophole for you to get premium currency is wild to think about in the gotcha gaming sphere of 2024. Where Wait, was tapped out a gotcha game? It wasn't a gotcha game. It was a... Oh, okay. premium game where you know you were paying to get you know get buildings to build faster or you know for quests to complete faster and stuff like that but just, just the was, notion was just tapped out just an idle game <laughs> yeah it, it was oh, definitely just an idle uh-huh. game uh-huh. uh but yeah the fact that and then i felt bad because my partner i tried it on her account did it for a few times and then ended up uh, rolling bad and losing her some premium currency. So she had to, <laughs> she felt bad and rebought the premium currency. So no, no. Uh, win some, you lose some. But yeah, pouring one out to Simpsons Tapped Out. I have it on my phone right now, but I'm, I don't know. I, I have the tummy rumblies when I think about opening it. But um, Matt, mm-hmm. in terms of going back to uh, Pocket Camp, Mm -hmm. Um, I know we say we kind of like, we don't expect this to be a trend going forward, but just the idea of making a complete version, um, do you think this is something that is just Nintendo being Nintendo or can you potentially see others following in its footsteps? I mean, I don't really see that many others following in its footsteps but i do hope that others follow in Mm -hmm. its footsteps because there's been so many gotcha games that i specifically haven't played because i don't want to fall into gotcha games yeah and you know having a feature complete version of that where it you know handles a lot more like a normal game would be very very appealing to me where again you know, my vice that I can't seem to drop uh, Bang Dream Girls Band Party. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think something like that, even though, you know, you do have the Nintendo Switch version, I feel like that would be something... I doubt Bushi Road would ever do it, though. But I think a rhythm Mm -hmm. game, once you strip out all the covers that they do because of licensing, but for their original songs, I feel like that specifically lends itself to having a quote-unquote complete version afterwards where you pay a price just to continue to pay uh, play at least the original songs but Mm -hmm. i guess history has shown that you know whenever um rhythm gotcha games have been you know end of service uh they're gone and yeah as much as I do appreciate Nintendo doing this, I, I feel like this is just a Nintendo thing. And even we we have to see if this would even affect Fire Emblem Heroes or Mario Kart in the future if it ever came to that. But uh, yeah, something to keep an eye on, especially this uh, coming n- uh, December. But Matt, Rikush, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh anything else? 
in terms of mistake to catch your eye this week? I mean, we were talking about food earlier, so all I wanted to say is uh, I accidentally cooked some funky smelling chicken yesterday. And uh, <laughs> have you guys ever done that? It was funky before you cooked it or funky after yeah. you cooked it? Before. Mm. I'm actually a decent cook, so, you know. I mean, I feel like funky before is more concerning because now it just has like bacteria poop all over it, right? Yeah. Rikushi, okay. your well, tummy rumbling. My tummy was rumbling all day today. Are you? Jaren. I wanted to talk about this earlier, but the flow of the podcast didn't really go there. But I did want to end the show without talking about tummy rumbles, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's a common enough thing that we have on our show that I feel like it's okay. By the way, going back to earlier, the the orange um, orange milkshake at my local McDonald's is four dollars and nineteen cents, which is very disappointing. <laughs> You need I to look at your spend. offers, Matt. Your offers. Oh, the see. offers. Yeah. Oh, okay. But um. Yeah. Why wouldn't it just be four twenty? Wow. Yeah. Like I don't understand why you wouldn't add that one cent for the goof. But uh, um, there's like McDonald's. ten seconds left before we hit an hour four twenty on my recording. <laughs> but before, or, or I guess after, Matt. Mm-hmm. I think we're coming to the closer of the show. And mm-hmm. now that we've officially hit the one hour, four minutes and 20 second mark, please wow. uh, take it to the don't match me zone. So, all right, we're going to be doing a don't match me. As always, the rules are that, you know, I'm going to ask five questions and I'm going to give five answers. All you have to do as the player is to not match the answer that I give to the question. Um, of course, we want to play on what? Sorry, you, I don't match Rikush, this the This is the second right time answer. you've done Don't Match Me Challenge. <laughs> you, as the player, yeah. I am going to give a question and I'm going to give an answer. Uh-huh. You, as the player, need to also provide an answer that does not match my answer. Okay, I remember this game now. Yes, okay. as a part of the Don't Match Me Challenge. All right, and, all right, all right. Um, you know, of course, if you want to play normally, you just have to not match me. If you want to play on a harder mode, you have to not match, I guess, now all of us on this podcast, which is uh, going to be a doozy once we get to the, you know, more strict questions. Um, and remember, as always, this is a podcast. If you need time to think about it, just pause us because we're going to be in your ears after you unpause us anyways. And, you know, for this Don't Match Me, I decided to, you know, in honor of our boy Rakush coming back. I have decided to do a sports base. Don't match me. Ooh. Oh dear God! Does it have to be the right answer? What do you mean the right answer? <laughs> like, do I have to answer it correctly? You have to answer the question correctly. Yes, you have oh, to answer okay. with like a legitimate answer. Cheese. <clears throat> All right. Let's okay. do this. Okay. Yo, starting up from you know question one. The sports base don't match me. Keeping in mind that I, as a person, have next to no interest in sports. The first question is, name any sports anime series. Ooh. So any series, any series. So, name that sports anime in three, two, one. I'm going with One Outs. Hmm. Ooh, you know what? That was part of the what's I was thinking about. I am going to go with Major. Mm-hmm. Okay. Not... Mm-hmm. <laughs> question uh-huh. <laughs> you, you know gotta gotta go to the referee here uh-huh uh-huh is horse racing a sport <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh god <laughs> jaren i think normally it wouldn't be but i feel like the way that you're going to drop it it is a sport <laughs> oh jeez. because i went with uma masumi pretty dirty uh, I, of course <laughs> jaren when we were in japan that was literally a commercial every two minutes that show literally has better animation than Blue Lock Season 2. <laughs> it does. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Moving on to, to question two. Okay. All right. So, similar to question one, name any sports-based video game series. Mm-hmm. And I think for it to qualify as a series, it'll need at least two games in its, uh, you know, two games in its franchise. Okay. Name that game in three, two, one. I'm going with the Mario Golf series. Ooh. Jerry, you want to go next? I don't know. Rikush, what did you go in? Fight Night. Okay. 
It's so bad. Uh-huh. It's horse racing. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I went with also with fight night. I think that's fine if you two match. <laughs> yeah, I think we can match because we're not hey. matching you mm-hmm. as the mm-hmm. don't match me mm-hmm. challenger. Mm-hmm. I was gonna say Mario Tennis. Would that mm. have been matching with you if you said Mario Golf? No, I think that's like a different thing. Those are two different sports. Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So going on to the third question for my sports based don't match me. Name a sport that uses a net. A sport that uses a net. I got it. Name that sport in three, two, one. I'm going with what I think is one of the obvious ones, tennis. I'm going with lacrosse. I went with basketball. Hey. Okay, so it seems like we're all good right now. Okay. Going on to my fourth question. Name an oppositional sport that doesn't use a ball. And what I mean by oppositional sport is like a sport that you're playing against, you know, someone else or another team. Not one where, like, you know, it's more so, like, archery or gymnastics where it's more so a points-based thing mm-hmm. or a graded thing, I guess, is a more accurate thing to say. So, basically, what you're saying is, like, because tennis is not going to be an answer for this one, but it's got to mm-hmm. have a one-on-one element. Yeah, a one-on-one or a team-on-team team element to it. Or a multiplayer element. Yeah, yeah. There's Just somebody no who could actively get in your way of doing whatever the, I guess, like objective of the sport is. Okay, I'd be really shocked if you guys picked the same one as I did. All right. So, oh, okay. <laughs> name that sport <laughs> in three, two, one. I'm going with Ultimate. Oh. Like Ultimate Frisbee? Ultimate Frisbee. I went with Amateur Wrestling. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going with Karen. What the hell is that? <laughs> it's it's a board game. But like you're base it's it's how do I explain it? There's like these miniature pucks basically on a wooden board that's like fully powdered down, and you're essentially playing billiards with those pucks where you're trying to shoot them oh, into okay. four or six nets. I believe it's four, like in one corner each. Damn, damn that's a pull. That's a pull. That's what I was talking. I'd be shocked if one of you got that one. Mm-hmm. Rikush, mm-hmm. I thought when you said that, I thought I immediately went to what's that? I guess Japanese schoolyard game where is it Kabani? I am not no sure what that what is. About. Okay, never mind. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I need to rewatch uh, Chio's School Road just to make sure I know what I'm talking about now. Okay. Okay. So going on to my final question of the, the sports base don't match me. It's name a sport played in one of the original Air Bud movies. So just name one of those sports in three. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, Are we talking about just Air Bud or are we talking about Air Bud Studios? No Air Buddies, no whatever the one after that was. So no, Air so no MVP, none of that shit. No MVP. Air Bud, wow. the golden okay, retriever is... that plays sports. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Name that Air Bud sport in three, two, one. I'm going with basketball. Oof. Does <laughs> Matt? <laughs> Kevin, this is it's so clear cut <laughs> on what could be an answer here. <laughs> Does volleyball count from Airbud Spikes Back? Also, I think it should. I think it should. It does. It does. does. Okay, I'm going with baseball from seventh inning fetch. Yeah, good, good, good good balls. Good balls. These are incredible subtitles, (laughs) dude. I love the titling. You know, honestly, just the Airbud movies, the original Airbud movies in general. Man, I'm gonna Mm -hmm. go watch some of those maybe. Oh man, I <coughs> okay. I man, they're okay. good. They're good. Jared, I sent you that T-shirt, right? I think so. Yes, you did. It's a good shirt. Maybe that will be the show art for this episode now. Okay. So Matt, it's a shirt that basically goes my pet smart, but my bud wiser. Oh my god, <laughs> it's great. Okay, might buy that shirt. Mm-hmm. Matt, I know you wanted a tier list segment. Uh, running out of time, but have to ask you guys. If we mm-hmm. were to do a tier list right now of Airbud subtitles, <laughs> uh, where would you put World Pup? I 
See, this is so hard. Just sometimes? They're all S tier to subtitles. <laughs> okay, if we only had to put one at S tier, one each at S tier, where does World Pop go? Oh, it's not the S tier one. I think, personally, I think the S tier one is seventh inning fetch. Oh, actually, Man. yeah. Seventh inning fetch is actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah, seventh inning fetch might be my favorite one of the subtitles. Mm hmm. There's just something about Spike's back where it's not like a dog related <laughs> pun, which you would think would dock points, but Spike's mm-hmm. back is such a good name to me. It's also just hilariously aggressive, right? Like mm-hmm. you could make it an action movie. It's very and that name three would still ninjas work. kick back. To yeah. Me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But to be fair, Golden Receiver is actually Golden Receiver is fantastic. It's good. These are good Ooh. subtitles. Matt, I thank you mm-hmm. for bringing <laughs> such a good round five don't match me. Oh, man. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's now good. now it's that good. you've opened the floodgates, mm-hmm. Matt and Rakush, mm-hmm. is a vault episode going to be one dedicated to one of these Airbud movies? Ooh. I mean, <laughs> maybe give me a whole episode to talk about the expanded universe. <laughs> I'm down for expanded Airbud universe. <laughs> Or even expanded um, pet animals playing sports universe. Oh, trust me, trust me. I've got it. I've got it all mapped out. Okay. okay. I don't think you guys understand how many years I've been sitting on that for. Okay. All right. Okay. <clears throat> well, next time one of us goes on vacation, we know what to do. But until then, I want to thank, as always, Matt for joining me this week, editing the podcast, and also bringing this "Don't Match Me" challenge. Also want to thank Rikush for joining us this week and hopefully for weeks to come. And who else should we thank? I know this is where Matt uh, (laughs) thanks me on the usual, but everything is out of order right now. So uh, I can still I can still throw some thanks to you. Yo, Jaren, as always, thanks for hosting the show. Thanks for bringing up these uh, orange milkshakes that are definitely going to hurt my Stomach later, you know, Rakush, thanks for coming back to the show and, you know, protecting your own stomach with your 0% milk. Yeah. Yeah. Losing some weight here because doctor's orders. Mm-hmm. We're getting old, guys. Yep. Rakush, this, that's literally what the first portion of this podcast is about. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank, guys, I want to thank Fujino. I want to thank Kiyomoto. Man, like her crying in that movie still gets to me. I'm thinking about it right now, and I'm on the verge of tears. Uh, I want to thank Granny Ayasi. I want to thank uh, Momo Cosplayers. Uh, I want to thank Matt. I want to thank Bernice. I want to mm. thank uh, Yanagi. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Miyabi for eventually coming home. Hopefully. There's ghost Miyabi in the next patch. Oh. I, I want to thank Shohei Otani. Ooh. I've fought Ghost Jane way too many times this week. But, <laughs> Matt, mm-hmm. please take it away. This is in the mistake zone, and we're all out of crying into our sweater sleeves. That's where you might be, not me. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>